You guys ready for this? I really don't think you're ready for this. These pit vipers are totally fake. Hi, welcome back everyone to the channel. I'm yet again in a new space, so that may be the norm now. I honestly don't know. Anyway, today we are looking at this. This is the mental disorder slash syndrome iceberg chart made by user Spaghetti Rush on Reddit. It's divided into seven tiers, each containing different mental disorders, syndromes, or symptoms of various conditions. I'm using the phrase mental disorder very lightly. I, I may refer to something as mental when it actually could be neurological or otherwise. I used information directly from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition text revision, aka the DSM-5-TR. This manual is the highest authority in the US in diagnosing clinical conditions properly. However, not all of the information I needed in order to, you know, explain things thoroughly was found in the DSM. So if you hear something and think, Wait, Matt, you said that you got everything from the DSM-5 and this thing that you just said isn't in the DSM-5. That may be why. Yeah, th th there are actually some conditions that just aren't recognized by the uh, by the American Psychiatric Association. So uh, a bunch of these conditions, especially the ones down, down towards the bottom of the iceberg, I, I couldn't find anything uh, from the from the DSM-5, so I just I had to go elsewhere. And that's okay because I still think that I, 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 I did pretty well, I hope. Some of you may recognize this iceberg since I already did a video on it in February. But as the comments section correctly pointed out, I got some stuff wrong. And since mental health is such an important subject, I've decided to come and make a revision to my previous video. Uh, I'm, I'm still keeping the old one up for now, so definitely check that out if you'd like. However, this is a more informative video, so I would stick with this one. It should be noted and emphasized that I am not an expert by any means. I'm just a guy who did some research. So do not take my word to be 100% accurate. I'm just scratching the surface here. So if you're at all curious about these disorders, then I would definitely go research them on your own. Or if you think that you might have one of these conditions, don't take my word for it, okay? Do not. Go speak to a, for a professional. I can't emphasize it enough. That's pretty much everything I have. So without further ado, let's do it. Starting off tier one is autism. Autism spectrum disorder is characterized by persistent impairments in social communication and interaction, as well as restricted and repetitive behaviors. These symptoms are typically present from early childhood and can significantly limit daily functioning. The extent of functional impairment may vary depending on individual characteristics and environmental factors. While core diagnostic features are evident during the developmental period, interventions and the current support systems can sometimes mask difficulty in certain contexts. The manifestations of autism spectrum disorder vary pretty widely based on the severity of the condition, developmental level, age, and potentially gender, hence the term spectrum. Patients without cognitive and language impairments may exhibit more subtle deficits, particularly in social communication if their overall communication skills are better. Similarly, the presence of restricted behavioral patterns and interests may be less obvious if the interests and behaviors align more closely with age-appropriate norms. Autism Spectrum Disorder encompasses various disorders that were previously referred to by different names, such as Early Infantile Autism, Childhood Autism, High Functioning Autism, Atypical Autism, Pervasive Developmental Disorder Not Otherwise Specified, Childhood Disintegrative Disorder, and Asperger's Syndrome. Depressive Disorders are a series of conditions with the common feature of a sad, empty, or irritable mood accompanied by related changes that significantly affect the patient's capability to function. What differs among these conditions are issues of duration, timing, and presumed etiology. Disruptive Mood Dysregulation Disorder, also known as DMDD, 
is characterized by chronic, severe irritability and frequent temper outbursts in response to frustration. These outbursts must occur three or more times per week for at least one year in multiple settings, accompanied by a developmentally inappropriate level of irritability. The existence of DMDD aims to differentiate chronic irritability from pediatric bipolar disorder, which has different criteria for diagnosis. Major depressive disorder is characterized by the presence of a major depressive episode lasting at least two weeks, featuring a depressed mood or a loss of interest in different activities. Additional symptoms include changes in appetite, sleep disturbances, decreased energy, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, difficulty concentrating, and suicidal thoughts. Social or occupational impairment may also occur as a result of this type of depression. Persistent depressive disorder, formerly known as dysthymic disorder, is characterized by a persistent depressed mood lasting at least two years for adults or just one year for children. The symptoms of persistent depressive disorder are essentially the same as major depressive disorder, however the distinction is in the duration of the symptoms. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder is characterized by recurring mood changes, irritability, dysphoria, and depressive symptoms during the premenstrual phase. Symptoms must occur in most menstrual cycles, impact work or social functioning, and cause distress or impairment in the week prior to menstruation. Substance slash medication induced depression disorder is characterized by persistent depressive feelings caused by substances or medications, hence the name. There are certain drugs, medications, and toxins that are more likely to induce depressive symptoms than others. These symptoms of depression or loss of interest occur during or after substance use, withdrawal, or medication exposure. The diagnosis requires that the symptoms are not explainable by non-substance induced depression and cause significant distress or impairment. Depressive disorder due to another medical condition is characterized by a prominent and persistent period of a depressed mood or diminished interest in activities, primarily caused by the physiological effects of a separate medical condition. To establish this diagnosis, there must be another medical condition and a link between the mood disturbance and the medical condition. Anorexia nervosa is characterized by three essential features, persistent energy intake restriction, an intense fear of gaining weight, and a distorted self-view of weight or shape. The patient will maintain a body mass index below the normal range for their age, sex, and their physical health. For adults, a BMI below 18.5 is considered significantly low, while a BMI below 17 indicates moderate or severe thinness. For children and adolescents, a BMI for age percentile is used with the 5 percentile suggesting that the child is underweight. The fear of gaining weight persists even as weight decreases, and distorted perceptions of body weight and shape are common. Patients may engage in behaviors to evaluate their body size or weight. Family members often actually bring attention to the marked weight loss, as patients with anorexia may not actually realize that there's an issue at all. Sleep paralysis is actually a symptom of multiple sleep-wake disorders. It's when your body begins to fall asleep, but when your mind stays active. This pretty much means that you'd be conscious, yet unable to move when falling asleep or waking up. Oftentimes, severe anxiety and paranoia can set in, making it a particularly distressing experience. It all stems from your REM sleep stage, or rapid eye movement. Your body locks its muscles into a relaxed state, a natural paralysis called REM atonia, so that you can't act out your dreams or nightmares. But, as it turns out, the real nightmare comes when your mind fails to follow suit with your body and stays completely active and conscious. Uh, I'll be right back, because my mom just got home with Chick-fil-A, so yeah. Oh yeah, here we go. What? Is my chair falling? Okay, that's not good. Alright, alright, we're 
right, we're good. Nightmare Disorder is a condition characterized by repeated occurrences of vivid, distressing dreams that often involved efforts to avoid threats and typically occur during the second half of your main sleep period, also known as nightmares. Upon waking from these dreams, the patient quickly becomes alert and oriented. The sleep disturbance causes significant distress or impairment in various areas of life. In order to be diagnosed with nightmare disorder, it must first be established that the nightmares are not caused by substance use and cannot be explained solely by other mental disorders or medical conditions. Insomnia disorder is characterized by dissatisfaction with sleep quality, difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep, and significant distress or impairment in various areas of life. Different types of insomnia can occur at different times during the sleep period, including sleep onset insomnia, sleep maintenance insomnia, and late insomnia. Non-restorative sleep, a complaint of poor sleep quality despite adequate duration, may also be associated with insomnia. Objective measures may not always align with subjective reports of sleep difficulties. Daytime impairments may include fatigue, sleepiness, cognitive, 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 oh my god, cognitive, mm, why can't I say it? Cognitive difficulties, there we go, mood disturbances, and impaired performance. Insomnia disorder is diagnosed when significant distress or impairment is present due to nighttime sleep difficulties. Specific phobias are characterized by intense and irrational fear or anxiety that is specific to a particular situation or object. The fear or anxiety must differ from normal everyday fears and may be accompanied by panic attacks. The fear or anxiety is evoked nearly every time the patient encounters what it is they fear. Great lengths of active avoidance of the situation or object is common, but exact behaviors can be either obvious or subtle. The fear or anxiety usually goes way beyond what is considered rational according to the danger of each subject. If the fear, anxiety, or avoidance persists for at least six months and causes significant distress in various areas of life, then it is a phobia. Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is characterized by symptoms that develop after exposure to a traumatic event. These symptoms can vary and include re-experiencing the event, avoidance behaviors, negative changes in mood and cognition, and alterations in arousal and reactivity. PTSD criteria involve different ways of exposure to the trauma, such as directly experiencing it, witnessing it, or just simply learning about it. Typically, to be diagnosed with PTSD, the patient must experience their symptoms for longer than one month. Internet gaming disorder is characterized by excessive and prolonged participation in online gaming, leading to cognitive and behavioral symptoms similar to substance use disorders. It involves intense competition and social interactions during play, often resulting in neglect of other activities and obligations. Patients with this disorder can spend 8 to 10 hours or more per day just gaming and become agitated when prevented from doing so. This disorder is actually in a section of the DSM that lists and details conditions for further study. So there's still a lot more that needs to be studied in regards to it. And interestingly enough, the South Korean government it regards this condition as a public health threat and specifically have prevention systems set up. We should probably have that in the US. A substance use disorder is characterized by cognitive behavioral, and physiological symptoms indicating continued substance use despite significant problems. Substance use disorders often involve changes in brain circuits, leading to repeated relapses and intense cravings. The diagnosis is based on impaired control, social impairment, risky use, and pharmacological criteria, or tolerance and withdrawal. Tolerance is the need for increased doses, while withdrawal is a series of symptoms upon the absence of a substance in the body, but you guys probably knew that. There, there is some expected tolerance and withdrawal from prescribed medication, which itself isn't an indicator of the disorder. However, misuse of prescribed or other substances and compulsive behaviors surrounding the substances 
do contribute to a diagnosis. Attention deficit slash hyperactivity disorder or ADHD is characterized by a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity slash impulsivity that hinders functioning or development. Inattention is seen as difficulty staying focused, being disorganized, and not following instructions. Hyperactivity refers to excessive motor activity or restlessness, while impulsivity involves impulsive actions without forethought. ADHD typically starts in childhood, and symptoms need to be present before the age of 12 in order for there to be a diagnosis, although the exact age of the onset symptoms may be challenging to determine retrospectively. It's important to observe symptoms in multiple settings and consult informants who have witnessed the patient's behavior. Symptoms may vary depending on the context, and they may be less apparent in certain situations or with external stimuli or supervision. The DSM says that any onset ADHD-like symptoms after age 13 are more likely to be attributed to other mental disorders or substance use effects, since ADHD is only diagnosable if the patient experiences symptoms before age 12. What that means is that an adult too can be diagnosed with ADHD, however, it's far less common. Mm. I think Chick-fil-A is the most unhealthy thing about me. Like, I, I go through three, three Chick-fil-A sauce packets, four honey roasted barbecue packets. Oh my God, that, that's so bad. An eight count nugget and a medium fry. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not good. Social anxiety disorder is characterized by a fear or anxiety in social situations in which the patient may be judged by others. The fear is centered around being negatively evaluated and can include concerns about appearing anxious, weak, crazy, boring, or unlikable, of which I am all of the above. Different patients may have specific fears, such as the fear of trembling, of sweating, blushing, or even offending other people. The fear and anxiety are almost always provoked by social situations and may be accompanied by anticipatory anxiety or panic attacks. Children may display their fear through crying, tantrum, or freezing up in social situations. Patients with social anxiety disorder often avoid the fear in social situations or endure them with some intense, intense fear. The fear and anxiety is usually disproportionate to the actual risk of the negative evaluation or its consequences, kind of like how it is with specific phobias. The duration of the disturbance is typically six months or more, and it significantly interferes with the patient's daily functioning, occupation, academics, social activities, or relationships. Exploding head syndrome is a mostly harmless sleep-wake condition where the patient will hear loud noises such as thunder, gunshots, or explosions in their head either when falling asleep or waking up. An episode of exploding head syndrome can also include flashing lights and having muscle spasms. Not a ton of research has actually been done into this condition. Doctors and researchers don't know how many people have it, what causes it, or even how to stop it. While perfectionism may be just a personality trait to some, to others, it's a sign of a serious mental health condition. Obsessive compulsive disorder, hoarding disorder, and different personality disorders may incite some perfectionist traits in a person. People experiencing this symptom will obsess over making everything flawless and perfect, even if that obsession cannot be fulfilled. Generalized anxiety disorder is characterized by excessive and disproportionate anxiety and worry about various events or activities. These worries are intense, long-lasting, and out of proportion to the actual likelihood of the anticipated events. Patients with this disorder struggle to control their worrying and find it difficult to focus on tasks. The worries typically revolve around everyday life circumstances, such as work responsibilities, health, finances, family well-being, and minor issues, and so on and so forth. This disorder is distinguished from normal anxiety by the severity and pervasiveness of worries 
their longer duration, and the absence of specific triggers. Physical symptoms may accompany the anxiety, including restlessness, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, and even disrupted sleep. The distress caused by the constant worry can significantly impair social, occupational, and other areas of functioning. The DSM doesn't actually say a lot about dyslexia. It on its own is not a diagnosis, but rather a specification with a particular learning disorder called specific learning disorder. It's a term that's used to refer to a pattern of learning difficulties characterized by problems with accurate or fluent word recognition, poor decoding, and poor spelling abilities. Patients experiencing dyslexia will have trouble reading, writing, and doing math. Patients with body dysmorphic disorder have a preoccupation with perceived defects or flaws in their physical appearance that are not observable or appear slight to others. These concerns can be related to various body areas such as the skin, hair, nose, or any other body part. The preoccupations are intrusive, time-consuming, and difficult to resist or control. Patients engage in excessive repetitive behaviors or mental acts, such as comparing their appearance, checking perceived defects, grooming excessively, seeking reassurance, or undergoing cosmetic procedures. These behaviors are driven by the preoccupation and often increase anxiety and dysphoria. The disorder causes clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. It is important, however, to differentiate body dysmorphic disorders from eating disorders. And there is also a form of the disorder called body dysmorphic disorder by proxy. This is where patients are preoccupied with perceived defects in another person's appearance. All right, and now we are on to tier two. Obsessive compulsive disorder has two main characteristics, obsessions and compulsions. Obsessions are intrusive and unwanted repetitive thoughts, images, and urges that cause distress or anxiety. Patients may make the attempt to ignore or neutralize these obsessions without much success. Compulsions, on the other hand, are repetitive behaviors or mental acts that patients feel compelled to perform in response to an obsession or strict rules. Compulsions are not performed for pleasure, but may actually provide some temporary relief because of the obsession. The specific content of obsessions and compulsions varies, but common themes include contamination, symmetry, forbidden thoughts, harm, and difficulty discarding objects. The obsessions and compulsions must be time-consuming or cause significant distress or impairment. This helps distinguish OCD from normal intrusive thoughts or repetitive behaviors. The frequency and severity of the symptoms may actually vary among different patients. <clears throat> Oppositional Defiant Disorder, also known as ODD, is characterized by a frequent and persistent pattern of an angry or irritable mood, argumentative or defiant behavior, and vindictiveness. While the symptoms can be limited to a specific setting, such as the home, they may also manifest in multiple settings. The severity of the disorder is determined by the pervasiveness of the symptoms across different relationships and settings. It's important to assess the patient's behavior beyond interactions with siblings and observe their behavior with other patients. The symptoms of ODD can occur to some degree in patients without the disorder, but a diagnosis requires meeting specific criteria, including the presence of at least four symptoms within six months. The persistence and frequency of the symptoms should exceed what is considered normal for the patient's age, gender, and culture. Patients with ODD often have problematic interactions with others and may justify their behavior as a response to perceived unreasonable demands or circumstances. It can be challenging to determine the relative contribution of the patient and their environment to these interactions. It can be challenging, however, to determine the relative contribution of the patient and their environment to these interactions. The diagnosis of a transvestic disorder does not apply to all people who dress as the opposite sex, 
even those who do so habitually. That is from the DSM-5. So what exactly is transvestic disorder? It's a condition that applies to patients who engage in cross-dressing and experience sexual arousal as a result of it, making it what's known as a paraphilia. That is about as far as I'm willing to go with my explanation. Uh, if you're curious about the disorder, I highly recommend Google.com. Not sponsored, by the way. Yet. Okay, before our next disorder, I should probably lightly go over how personality disorders are grouped. The three clusters of personality disorders are characterized as follows. Cluster A includes paranoid, schizoid, and schizotypal personality disorders with patients appearing odd or eccentric. Cluster B includes antisocial, borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic personality disorders with patients appearing dramatic, emotional, or erratic. Finally, cluster C includes avoidant, dependent, and obsessive compulsive personality disorders with patients appearing anxious or fearful. However, it is important to note that this clustering system does have its limitations and lacks consistent validation, as patients can exhibit traits from multiple clusters or have co-occurring disorders of varying intensity and pervasiveness. So it's not a perfect system that needs to be noted. Schizotypal personality disorder is a cluster A personality disorder. It's characterized by a pervasive pattern of social and interpersonal deficits accompanied by cognitive and perceptual distortions as well as eccentric behaviors. Patients of this disorder may incorrectly interpret events as having a unique meaning for them and may exhibit some superstitious beliefs or a preoccupation with paranormal phenomena. They may experience perceptual alterations such as sensing the presence of another person or hearing murmuring voices. Their speech may be idiosyncratic, vague, or digressive, and they may demonstrate paranoid ideation and suspicion towards others. Difficulties in forming close relationships, social anxiety, and discomfort in social situations are highly common. However, this diagnosis is not made if the symptoms can be attributed to schizophrenia or other related disorders. Brief psychotic disorder is characterized by the presence of at least one psychotic symptom, such as delusions, hallucination, disorganized speech, or abnormal behavior. The episode lasts for a minimum of one day, but less than one month, and the patient eventually returns to their previous level of functioning. It's important to rule out other conditions like depressive or bipolar disorders with psychotic features, schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, substance abuse effects, or medical conditions. Borderline personality disorder is a cluster B personality disorder. It's characterized by a pervasive pattern of instability in relationships, self-image, and emotions, along with marked impulsivity. Patients with this disorder exhibit intense fear of abandonment, engage in unstable and intense relationships, and may experience a distorted self-image. They display impulsive and self-damaging behaviors such as substance abuse and sometimes self-mutilation. Recurrent suicidal thoughts and gestures are common, and they often struggle with intense mood swings and feelings of emptiness. Inappropriate, intense anger, as well as transient paranoid ideation and dissociative symptoms under extreme stress may also be present. Gambling disorder is characterized by persistent and recurrent maladaptive gambling behaviors that disrupts personal, family, and vocational aspects of life. It involves symptoms such as chasing losses, placing larger bets to recover losses, and engaging in deceit to conceal gambling activities. Patients with gambling disorder may also resort to illegal behaviors or seek financial assistance due to their gambling-related financial difficulties. It should be noted, however, that in some cases, symptoms of gambling disorder can be induced as a direct consequence of taking certain medications. What's interesting to me is that it's the only non-substance-related addictive dis disorder. 
but it is in the same category as alcoholism and other substance use disorders. Histrionic personality disorder is a cluster B personality disorder and is characterized by pervasive and excessive emotions and attention-seeking behavior. Patients with this disorder constantly seek to be the center of attention and may even resort to dramatic actions to draw focus to themselves. They often display inappropriate sexual seductiveness and have shallow and rapidly shifting emotional expressions. Concerned with their physical appearance, they often spend excessive time and effort on grooming and seek validation through compliments. Their style of speech is impressionistic and lacking in detail, and they tend to self-dramatize and exhibit exaggerated emotions. They are highly suggestible and easily influenced by others, often perceiving relationships as more intimate than they actually are. Schizoid personality disorder is a cluster A personality disorder. It's characterized by a pervasive pattern of detachments from social relationships and a very limited range of emotional expression in interpersonal settings. Patients with this disorder appear to have very little desire for intimacy and show indecency towards developing close relationships. They often prefer solitary activities and lack interest in social interactions. They derive minimal pleasure from sensory or interpersonal experiences and may have a reduced capacity for experiencing emotions such as joy or anger. They typically display a bland or unreactive demeanor and have difficulty understanding social cues or appropriately responding to them. While they may seem socially inept or superficial, they're generally unaffected by the opinions or criticisms of others. It is important to note, however, that schizoid personality disorder is not diagnosed if the pattern of behavior can be attributed to other mental health conditions such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Alice in Wonderland syndrome is a rare condition in which patients have recurring episodes of distorted views of reality. This manifests itself in multiple ways, including size distortion, sound distortion, or time distortion, which may also cause frequent migraines. Essentially, it might feel like transitioning between worlds, like Alice going through the looking glass. It's believed to be caused primarily by an electrical abnormality in the brain. Other possible causes include brain tumors, seizures, use of cough medicine or hallucinogenic drugs, or epilepsy. However, one study has shown that 33% of patients with this disorder has had one or more infections. Unfortunately, the same study shows that half of the subjects had no apparent cause. Agoraphobia is characterized by a very particular fear or anxiety triggered by various situations. These situations can include using public transport, being in open or enclosed spaces, standing in line or being in a crowd, or even being outside the home alone. Patients of agoraphobia often experience thoughts of something terrible happening to them when they're in these circumstances and believe that help or escape may be particularly difficult to have during panic-like or incapacitating symptoms. The fear or anxiety is constantly evoked by the feared situations and leads to active avoidance or intense distress if confronted. The fear and avoidance are really appropriate for the actual danger present and can cause significant impairment in daily life. The symptoms must persist for at least six months and result in clinically significant distress or impairment. Antisocial personality disorder is a cluster B personality disorder that is characterized by a pervasive pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others. It typically begins in childhood or early adolescence and continues into adulthood. The patient shows a lack of conformity to social norms, engages in deceitful and manipulative behaviors, acts impulsively without considering consequences, displays aggression and a disregard for the safety of others, exhibits irresponsibility in various areas of life, and lacks remorse for their actions. The diagnosis requires evidence of conduct disorder before the age of 15. I, I feel like it's important to note, however, that people with ASPD or antisocial personality disorder are still people and deserve to be treated as such. Their conduct may not be great, 
but it should be understood that they literally do not function the same as the rest of us. So no, they should not be treated like criminals. Pica is characterized by the persistent consumption of non-nutritive, non-food substances for at least one month, requiring clinical attention. The ingestive items can vary based on age and availability, such as paper, soap, hair, chalk, paint, and much more. The behavior must be developmentally inappropriate and not culturally or socially supported. Pica is not diagnosed when consuming diet products with minimal nutritional content, and there's usually no aversion to regular food. If the eating behaviors occur exclusively within another mental disorder, a separate diagnosis of pica is given only if it requires additional clinical attention. Narcissistic personality disorder, a cluster B personality disorder, is characterized by a pervasive pattern of grandiosity, a need for admiration, and a lack of empathy. Patients with this disorder may have an inflated sense of self-importance, exaggerating their superiority and accomplishments while devaluating others. They often fantasize about unlimited success and expect special recognition from others. Seeking excessive admiration, they require constant validation and may fish for compliments from other people. They possess a sense of entitlement and expect favorable treatment, showing little regard for the needs or feelings of others. They may even exploit others for their own personal gain and lack emotional empathy. Envious of others' achievements, they display arrogant and haughty behaviors, often displaying snobbish or even patronizing attitudes. Again, people with this kind of disorder should not be treated like awful people. They are still people, beautiful creations of God and deserve respect. So yeah, there's my, there's my TED talk. All right, everyone, real quick. I really hope you guys are enjoying the video so far. If you've made it this far, then I assume you are. I think it's safe to say that you're enjoying the video. So if you really think I deserve it, if you are enjoying the video, then I'd love your support through liking the video and subscribing to the channel. It, it just, it, it means so, so much. And it's the reason that I'm doing this. So if that's something that you decide to do, then thank you from the bottom of my heart. And even if you don't want to like the video or subscribe to the channel, you just want to watch this to get to sleep or something, that's okay too. Thank you for, for watching so, so much. Uh, anyway, back to the video. Now we are on to tier three, starting off with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a complex disorder characterized by a variety of cognitive, behavioral, and emotional dysfunctions. It's diagnosed based on a constellation of symptoms that lead to impaired functioning in occupational or social areas. These symptoms include delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, grossly disorganized behavior, and the loss of normal functions. These symptoms must persist for six months or more in order to receive a diagnosis. Additionally, the disorders associated with persistent impairment and may involve early onset and residual symptoms. Mood symptoms can coexist, but should not be a cofactor in diagnosing a person. And assessing cognition and other symptom domains is important for accurate diagnosis. DID, or Dissociative Identity Disorder, is characterized by the presence of two or more distinct personality states or experiences of possession. These states can vary in their overt or covert expression and may involve sudden alterations in sense of self, agency, and perception. Patients may also experience dissociative amnesia, gaps in memory, and unexpected shifts in attitudes and behaviors. These symptoms cause significant distress or impairment in a person's life, but cultural or religious practices involving possession states are not considered disassociative identity disorder. I first heard of DID when it was still being referred to as multiple personality disorder. In Total Drama Season 4, there was a character named Mike who supposedly had MPD. I'll be real with you guys, I love Total Drama. Don't get me wrong, but they handled Mike's MPD horribly. So horribly, in fact, that I didn't even think MPD, or DID rather, was even a real thing up until reading up in my research. So, yeah, don't take cartoon displays of mental disorders seriously, I guess. Anyway, 
Onerophrenia is a condition characterized by a dreamlike and hallucinatory state that shares some symptoms with schizophrenia, including disturbances of emotion. However, it is differentiated from schizophrenia by its specific features, such as sensory disturbances and clouding of consciousness. This state is often associated with factors like prolonged sleep deprivation, sensory deprivation, or drug use. Although it isn't acknowledged as a distinct clinical condition, onerophrenia represents a very unique experience with its own set of symptoms and contributing factors. Erotomania, aka this guy's syndrome, is a subtype of delusional disorder that applies to a patient who experiences the deeply held delusion that another person is in love with them. That person could be a neighbor, a friend, or someone they haven't ever met, such as a celebrity or politician. According to the DSM, it's usually the latter. Parental alienation syndrome, as defined by the American Psychological Association, is a child's experience of being manipulated by one parent to turn against the other. PAS is characterized by specific symptoms, including restless depreciation of the target parent, lack of guilt or ambivalence, automatic support for the alienating parent, and borrowed scenarios in the children's speech. However, PAS lacks empirical evidence and standardized diagnostic criteria, and major professional associations don't really recognize it, which is why it's not found in the DSM. Nonetheless, the broader concept of parental alienation brings to light the negative impact on a child's well-being due to exposure to unfavorable actions or criticism from one parent toward the other. Factitious disorder is characterized by patients intentionally falsifying signs and symptoms of medical or psychological illness in themselves or others, even in the absence of external rewards. They may exaggerate, fabricate, simulate, or induce injuries or diseases to deceive others. The focus is on the objective identification of falsification rather than the motives behind it. Patients with factitious disorder may seek excessive medical intervention and can engage in various deceptive behaviors, such as reporting false symptoms, manipulating test results, or inducing injury or illness. While most seek treatment from healthcare professionals, some may also mislead others in the community or online about their supposed condition. When all this is levied on the person with the disorder, it's known as factitious syndrome imposed on self. And when it's levied on another person, it's known as factitious syndrome imposed on another, also known as FDIA. The most popular and notable case of this condition is that of FDIA patient Dee Dee Blanchard, who was murdered by her daughter Gypsy and a boyfriend after she falsely claimed for years that Gypsy was sick. But that's a topic for another time. I gotta turn on the fan, I'm dying here, oh my god. It is hot in this room, okay? It is very hot. Wasting time. <sighs> Great. Now I have to talk about this one. Rumination disorder is a condition characterized by the repeated regurgitation of food without apparent nausea or disgust. The regurgitated food, which may be partially digested, is brought back into the mouth and then either rechewed or re-swallowed. Yep, this behavior occurs very frequently, typically several times per week, and lasts for at least one month. It is not due to a gastrointestinal or medical condition, and it is not associated with anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, or avoidance slash restrictive food intake disorder. The disorder can be observed directly or reported by the patient or their caregivers, and it may coexist with intellectual developmental disorder. This behavior is often described as habitual or outside of the patient's control. And now I don't have to talk about it anymore, so I'm going to be in a good mood for the rest of this. That's better. Dependent personality disorder is a cluster C personality disorder characterized by a pervasive and excessive need 
to be taken care of by others. Patients with this disorder exhibit submissive and clinging behaviors and have a fear of separation. They have difficulty making everyday decisions without seeking excessive advice and reassurance from others. They often rely on a single person to assume responsibility for major areas of their entire lives. Expressing disagreement or anger is challenging for them as they fear losing support or approval. They lack self-confidence and struggle to initiate tasks or projects independently, believing that others can do them better. They may even go to great lengths to obtain nutrients and support, even tolerating abusive behavior. Being alone often makes them feel uncomfortable and helpless due to exaggerated fears of being unable to care for themselves. When a close relationship ends, they quickly seek another relationship to fulfill their need for care and support. They're preoccupied with fears of being left to fend for themselves, even when such fears are excessive and unrealistic. Bulimia nervosa is a condition that is characterized by recurring episodes of binge eating, followed by appropriate redeeming behaviors to prevent weight gain. Patients with bulimia place excessive emphasis on body shape and weight in their self-evaluation. These behaviors occur at least once a week for three months. Binge eating involves consuming large amounts of food in a short amount of period, accompanied by a sense of loss of control. Compensatory behaviors include self-induced vomiting, misuse of laxatives, excessive exercise, or even fasting. Body shape and weight heavily influence self-esteem for people with this disorder. It is important, however, to distinguish bulimia nervosa from anorexia nervosa. Bipolar disorder isn't necessarily a condition, but rather a series of conditions that all surround the theme of rapid, frequent, or unpredictable mood swings. It exists as a kind of spectrum and bridges the gap between depressive and schizophrenic disorders. That's because bipolar disorders are diagnosed based on the frequency and severity of manic, hypomanic, and depressive episodes that a patient experiences. These are the types of bipolar disorders as noted in the DSM. Bipolar 1 is characterized by manic episodes, which are distinct periods of abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable moods, and of normally and persistently increased activity or energy, lasting at least one week and present for most of the day, nearly every day. Bipolar 2 is characterized by hypomanic episodes, which are pretty much the same as manic episodes except they last for a shorter duration of time, which would be at least four days. And major depressive episodes, which is when five or more symptoms of depression are present in a patient in a two-week period. Cyclothymic disorder, on the other hand, is characterized by some symptoms of manic, hypomanic, and major depressive episodes, but never meet the criteria for any of them for a period of at least two years. These are the main three types of bipolar disorder. However, there are more, such as substance-induced bipolar and unspecified mood disorder. Due to time, however, I will be skipping over those. Kleptomania is characterized by the recurrent inability to resist the urge to steal items, even when they have no personal or monetary value. Before stealing, patients feel increasing tension, and then the act of stealing provides them with some pleasure or relief from that tension. The stealing is not driven by anger, revenge, delusions, or hallucinations, and it cannot be attributed to other disorders. The stolen items are often of rather little importance to the patient who usually can afford to pay for the item. The behavior is typically impulsive and not pre-planned, and it is carried out independently without the involvement of others. Hallucinogen Persisting Perception Disorder, also known as HPPD, is characterized by the recurrence of perceptual disturbances experienced during intoxications with hallucinogens when the patient is sober. Visual disturbances such as geometric hallucinations, false perceptions of movement, and intensified colors are very common. These disturbances can be episodic or continuous and cause significant distress or impairment in various areas of functioning. The duration can range from weeks to even years 
and other potential causes must be ruled out. The disorder is often associated with LSD use, but can also occur with minimal exposure to different hallucinogens. It may be triggered by other substances, dark environments, exercise, and other sensory stimuli. Tourette syndrome is a neurological disorder characterized by the presence of multiple motor and vocal tics that persist for more than one year. Tics are these sudden, involuntary movements or vocalizations that can range from very simple motions or sounds to complex gestures or whole phrases. The condition typically starts around childhood as the onset must be before age 18 and is not caused by substance use or other medical conditions. Tourette syndrome is professionally known as Tourette's disorder and is categorized as one of three tick disorders, which are each diagnosed based on the presence of their tics, the duration, and the absence of other causes, so on and so forth. All right, everyone, so here is the situation. Um, I have done a take of the following section about four times, and just as I thought that I had my best take yet, my camera stopped working. So for that entire section, uh, it's just going to be my voice. So from now on, it's just my voice. I hope that's okay. Uh, I'm really sorry about the error. I really, really wish that that weren't the case, but hey, it is what it is. However, I don't really think it's gonna make that much of a difference because I'd say about a third of you are asleep by this point. So yeah, anyway, back to the video. All right, we are now in tier four. Reduplicative paramnesia is a condition characterized by a false memory or delusion where patients firmly believe that a familiar person or place has been duplicated or relocated entirely. For example, they may believe that the hospital they are in exists in two different locations at the same time. This condition is often associated with neurological disorders and brain lesions affecting the frontal lobes or the right hemisphere are commonly observed to be underlying causes. Gordon. It's one of a series of delusional misidentification syndromes which are all characterized by having delusions of mislabeling or misidentifying people, places, or objects as being something else. Diogenes syndrome, also referred to as senile squalor syndrome, is a behavioral condition characterized by severe self-neglect, withdrawal from social interactions, and a propensity for hoarding. People affected by this syndrome typically reside in unclean and unsanitary environments, amassing an excessive accumulation of clutter and rejecting assistance or intervention. It predominantly occurs among older adults, and while the precise causes remain unclear, it is believed to stem from a combination of physical, psychological, and social factors. The name actually comes from a man named Diogenes, a 4th century Greek philosopher who lived in a barrel preaching the philosophy of cynicism. However, I don't really see a correlation between the cynic philosophy and, and this condition, so the name must be that way simply because Diogenes is pretty notorious for being a guy who generally lived in filth. I don't personally agree with the naming choice, but it is what it is. Stendhal syndrome, also referred to as hyperculturemia or Florence syndrome, is a psychological phenomenon characterized by a strong emotional and physical response triggered by exposure to art or beauty. People with Stendhal syndrome may experience symptoms such as a rapid heart rate, dizziness, confusion, and even fainting when encountering overwhelming aesthetic experiences. The syndrome is named after French writer Stendhal, who described his own intense encounter with art while visiting Florence. Although not officially recognized as a medical condition, Stendhal syndrome is thought to arise from a combination of factors, including heightened sensitivity, emotional susceptibility, and the profound impact of artistic stimuli. Koro syndrome is a subtype of other specified obsessive compulsive and related disorder that's characterized by the intense fear and belief that one's genitals breasts, or other body parts are shrinking or retracting into their body somehow, leading to the fear of impending death or harm. This syndrome is often accompanied by anxiety, panic attacks, and a strong preoccupation with body image. 
Koro actually spread around Southeast Asia like a disease. It literally was a mass hysteria in 1976 when about 200 people reported the intense anxiety that their genitals were just going to retract into their body. I think it's important to mention though that while Koro sounds pretty similar to body dysmorphic disorder, it's different in the sense that it isn't about a perceived ugliness, but rather in death and morbidity. Fergoli syndrome is another delusional misidentification syndrome, kind of like reduplicative paramnesia, in which the patient will believe that one or more imaginary persecutors have changed their shape or appearance, like a shapeshifter coming to get them, or like the creature from It Follows. Patients with Fergoli syndrome may exhibit hypervigilance, constantly scanning their environment for signs of the disguised person. They may interpret everyday coincidences as deliberate acts to maintain the disguise. This condition can be accompanied by other psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Abulamania, also known as abulia, is a neurological condition characterized by a severe loss of motivation. People with abulia struggle to engage in voluntary actions and may appear apathetic or rather indifferent. It's often caused by brain injuries or disorders affecting the frontal lobe or basal, basal ganglia. Basal, basal ganglia? This. It's often fostered into a child during early development. A kid's parent may have dependency troubles of their own and reward loyalty, yet punish any attempts at freedom or self-reliancy made by the child. This results in the child becoming overly dependent on the parent, and so unfortunately, those same developmental issues create problems later in life. It's also found in patients of any age of various cognitive disorders. Capgras syndrome is another delusional misidentification syndrome like Fergoli syndrome. It's characterized by the delusional belief that a person's loved ones or familiar people have been replaced by identical postures or completely duplicated. Okay, wow. This condition often causes significant distress and confusion for those affected. It's commonly associated with neurological conditions such as brain injuries, dementia, or psychiatric disorders. Also similarly to Fergoli syndrome, it's believed to be caused by brain trauma or neurological disorders. It's also linked to prosopagnosia, which is a condition that causes patients to not see faces. Literally, people's faces become blurs and you cannot identify them. That and schizophrenia, among a few others, can lead to this and other kinds of delusions. charcot wilbrand syndrome is a condition in which the patient has lost the ability to dream, or rather feels as though they can't. However, this isn't necessarily the case. Researchers believe that patients of charcot wilbrand syndrome suffer from visual agnosia, which is the inability to identify items visually and the inability to remember images in their mind. We know this because studies of charcot wilbrand syndrome have shown that REM sleep, which is the period when dreams occur, continues as normal in patients. Various physiological injuries or conditions such as brain hemorrhages, Alzheimer's disease, and even carbon monoxide poisoning have been theorized to be causes of this condition. Boanthropy is a rare condition in which the patient believes that they have transformed into a cow or an ox. Patients experiencing boanthropy may exhibit behaviors and actions resembling those of the animal that they believe they have become. This condition is often associated with underlying mental health issues such as schizophrenia or other psychotic disorders. <coughs> Typically, patients believe that they have become cows. The name boanthropy actually comes from the Greek word bos or cow and anthropy or human. Patients will usually moo or eat grass or try to do literally anything that they know a cow to do. Personally, and not that my opinion means much, I don't think that this is a unique enough delusion to justify it being separate from another condition called lycanthropy, which we're going to get to in a bit. Narcolepsy is a neurological disorder characterized by recurrent daytime sleepiness and cataplexy, or sudden muscle weakness. The diagnosis of narcolepsy is based on specific symptoms such as sleepiness, cataplexy, hypocretin deficiency, and abnormal sleep study findings. 
Type 1 narcolepsy is typically characterized by the presence of cataplexy, while type 2 narcolepsy lacks cataplexy, but might show other symptoms and sleep study abnormalities. The condition can result from various causes, including neurological, infectious, metabolic, and genetic factors. All right, we are now on to tier five. Shared psychotic disorder, also known as this word that I'm not going to pronounce, which is French for double insanity, is a condition in which patients, and that's plural by the way, share a common delusional belief. It's commonly found in families and is extremely rare. How it usually happens is one person, the one originally with the belief, known as the inducer, convinces another person who may or may not be prone to psychosis or delusions that their delusion is real. And so both people now share the same delusion. It can occasionally be applicable to groups of three or four, in which case it's called this and this respectively. Truman syndrome, also known as the Truman Show delusion, is a condition in which patients believe that they are being recorded or filmed as a subject for a large reality show production, like Truman from the movie The Truman Show. It's believed to be a sign of an underlying condition like schizophrenia or other delusional disorders. Critics of the proposed disorder don't actually believe that it's at all a unique condition, and rather is a specific grandiose or persecutory delusion. Some researchers believe it to be caused by reality TV and, of course, the Truman Show. I think that's unfair though, because if a person has an underlying condition that causes them to have a delusion like this, then it's highly likely that even without reality TV, they would still have some sort of delusion. It just so happens that pop culture influences delusions just like it does everything else. Clinical lycanthropy, also known as lycomania, is a condition in which patients begin to believe that they are turning into an animal, or more specifically, that they're like werewolves beginning to transform. The name actually comes from the Greek word for wolf, or lyco, and human, or anthropy. It's believed to be a sign of a brain injury, dementia, and even drug withdrawal. Patients will begin to believe that they're experiencing physical changes, like they're growing a tail or they have more hair on their arms or legs. They might also growl or howl or even walk on all fours. Alien limb syndrome is a condition in which patients experience their limbs moving seemingly on their own. It's, again, likely caused by a brain injury, aneurysm, or other trauma. Patients will experience episodes where they do not have control over their own limb, usually their hand, which is where the more specific alien hand syndrome comes from. Studies have shown that parts of patients' brains tend to have isolated activity within that part, which may lead to uncontrollable movement. It's believed to be related to brain lesions on the supplementary motor area of the corpus callosum. Hysterical blindness, also known as functional blindness or conversion disorder, is a condition in which a person experiences temporary or sudden vision loss without any organic or physical cause. The loss of vision is typically attributed to psychological factors rather than a structural or physiological abnormality in the eyes. It's often associated with stress, trauma, or psychological distress. These events can cause the brain to temporarily shut off impulses from the eyes to the brain to try to block the source of the trauma. Otherwise, it's likely caused by a broader psychological disorder, mainly one of the sleep-wake disorders. All right, we are here in tier six. This is where the fun begins. kluver busey syndrome is a rare neurological disorder characterized by a range of um, strange behaviors resulting from damage to the temporal lobes of the brain. Patients with kluver busey syndrome may exhibit symptoms such as putting non-food items in their mouth, visual agnosia, which I mentioned earlier, hypersexuality, emotional changes, and a loss of fear or caution. A diagnosis of kluver busey syndrome can easily be made in error though, since a lot of the symptoms are shared with conditions like pica and Alzheimer's disease. 
Apodomnophilia, also known as Body Integrity Identity Disorder, or BIID, is a rare psychological condition characterized by a strong desire to amputate a healthy limb or to be disabled in some way. Patients with apodomnophilia often experience a persistent and distressing belief that their body does not match their true identity, leading to a desire for amputation or disability. This condition is not related to sexual attraction or fetishism, but is primarily driven by a desire for body modification. It is, however, most commonly associated with body dysmorphic disorder. Not filling their urges or not getting help can cause significant emotional distress, since for patients of this condition, being paralyzed is a part of their chosen identity. Cotard syndrome, also known as Cotard's delusion or walking corpse syndrome, is a rare psychiatric disorder characterized by the delusional belief that one is dead, does not exist, or has lost their internal organs or body parts. Patients with Cotard syndrome may experience profound feelings of emptiness, nihilism, and a disconnection from reality. They may believe that they are in a state of eternal damnation or that they are literally physically decomposing. Patients might also stop taking care of themselves entirely since they don't really see a point in it now that they're, you know, dead. It's believed to be the result of various brain injuries or traumas such as dementia, a stroke, depression, or, of course, schizophrenia. However, it's usually recorded in association with a brain bleed, brain lesions, or neurological damage. Alright, and finally we are at the end. We are at tier 7 now. Pyrophilia is a type of paraphilia, which means that the patient gets a sexual thrill out of unusual or extreme things, such as pedophilia or sexual masochism. Pyrophilia, therefore, is a condition in which patients get sexual gratification or pleasure out of fire in whatever nature or sense. This includes fire stations, fire starting materials, fire alarms, and obviously fire itself. But the point is that it's not just about fire. The danger with this condition, however, lies in how a patient may go about fulfilling their fantasies. They could start a random fire, play with lighters, set off a fire alarm in a public place, all which could result in themselves or others potentially getting hurt. Not to be confused with autophagy, which is a natural, normal, biological term, autophagia is a condition in which patients bite or eat their own body. Nine times out of ten, this manifests itself in a patient simply biting their nails or hair, usually because of anxiety. But in some extreme cases, they'll gnaw on their fingers or hands and even cause amputation or ingestion of their own flesh. Obviously, the symptoms range from very mild to literally life-threatening, so it's hard to pinpoint only a few causes. It could be simple anxiety or something like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Patients of these conditions are prone to experiencing command hallucinations, which is the kind where an inner voice makes commands. Obviously, though, that's not everyone. It's not specifically mentioned in the DSM, However, a description of it is mentioned plenty of times as a type of self-injury, which is a symptom of all sorts of disorders, from anxiety disorders all the way to Tourette's. Quite frankly, I don't know why this is here. Folly and Famille, I really hope I'm pronouncing that right, is a condition in which the members of a family share the same specific delusion. You may remember back in the fifth tier, there was one called Shared Delusional Disorder. Uh, yeah, th this, is, this is pretty much the same thing. Except this is a specific subtype in which the members of a family share a delusion. I could really only find one specific article that's unique at all to this condition, uh, and this was found by another Redditor. Italian forensic physicians reported a case involving a 52-year-old man living with his father's mummified body for several months. The discovery was made when the police responded to a dispute between neighbors. The man exhibited signs of a psychotic disorder, including emotional distancing, delusions of persecution, 
and a delirium about the involvement of his neighbors, the police, and even the Pope and the Italian Prime Minister in a conspiracy against him. The man used deodorants to mask the odor of the decaying body and believed that he was protecting his father from their supposed tormentors. The investigation revealed that the man's mother had also suffered from mental illness and had died years earlier. It's believed that the mother and son at least, maybe even the father too, suffered from folie and famille. And there we have it. I would again like to thank every single one of you for watching the video. It, 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 it just, it means so much to me if you've gotten this far and actually, you know, given me the time of day. Just your view alone means the world to me. So if you've, if you've gotten all the way through, if you've watched this entire thing, which I don't know how anyone will, but uh, thank you so, so much. And again, if you think I deserve it, I would really, really appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel. This channel has been growing so, so much. At least so much more than I thought it would. Right now, we have 471 subscribers, which is an insane amount. It's way more than I think I deserve, and definitely way more than I thought that I would have on this channel um, by this point, but I, I, I really am grateful to have, to have all of you. If you're subscribed, thank you very, very much. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. And if you're going to subscribe, then thank you so, so much. Um, I'm really, really happy that, that you guys are gonna be joining along. And if you have any comments, questions, or concerns about the video or the channel or whatever, then feel free to leave something down in the comments section. I'll try my best to respond to everyone. Yeah, that is just about all there is to say. So without further ado, God loves you. Have a great day. Bye.